Richard and I didn't talk before uh, uh, his talk, but I actually wanted to pick up exactly where he left off. So Richard said there are three elements of reform. One, political will. Two, content. And three, process. And what we've heard from Richard is a really interesting and, I think, comprehensive view of the legal requirements required for reform. I wanted to talk about the extra legal process that's required for reform. And I also wanted to spend some time talking about content. Um, we just mentioned, you know, in, in Canadian politics, historically, we haven't had a chance really to understand what the government is intending on doing because that letter to the minister has always been private. Well, this election, as you know, the mandate letter is public. And that actually offers citizens and political scientists a really great view into the stated intentions of the government. So the mandate letter for the Minister of Democratic Institutions says, to bring forward a proposal to establish a parliamentary committee to consult on electoral reform, including preferential ballots, proportional representation, mandatory voting, and online voting. Well, here's a really interesting and vexing question. On one hand, the government has said they're going to consult Canadians. On the other hand, as Richard just mentioned, they've also said this will be the last election under first past the post. So we seem to have a bit of a dilemma that the government is already committed to change, but wants to consult Canadians on whether change is necessary. I think that's going to be an interesting dilemma. So let me just talk about those two things, process, make some observations about process and content. So process. First of all, the extra, the special parliamentary committee. So as you know, the um, government has a majority government, so there will be a majority of liberals on that uh, parliamentary committee. Uh, the mandate letter says that they will consult on electoral reform. What does that mean? Well, traditional modes of parliamentary committee consultation is to hear witnesses, uh, issue studies, and then have a, a recommendation that's debated in parliament. I don't think that's what they intend on doing. It's not just sort of my over-optimistic view of that. Um, I think that one of the th uh, one of the um, reasons they won't do that is because they're not going to hold a referendum. And if they're not going to hold a referendum, then I think they're committed to holding, they must be committed to holding real, meaningful, deliberative engagement exercises. So, um, you know, the best predictor of what a government does is what they've done in the past. So what insight or what evidence do I have to suggest that the government is going to do things differently? I don't know. For, but I do know that on the issue of climate change, which is a really significant plank in their platform, they have asked Alberta Senator Grant Mitchell and several uh, academics uh, to think about a citizen engagement strategy around that. So they understand, at least on that important pillar of their platform, that it's important to create wide buy-in and create an opportunity for public education. And as Richard mentioned, this is a great opportunity for public education that we're already seeing beginning. I think they want to avoid the conventional approaches to public engagement that provide citizens who are already mobilized on an issue uh, chances to say what they already think and that have little visibility on their final decision. Um, I think uh, these sort of drive-by consultations, if you were, uh, create cynicism, have little effect on public learning, and indeed affect political legitimacy, a key word that Richard mentioned, which I think has to be at the heart of any change to electoral systems. So there needs to be an opportunity to understand the policy choices and trade-offs. Prior to that, we need to have a discussion on what an electoral system should do. From where I sit, the discussion has really been about which system we want. Do we want a PR system? Do we want an a alternative vote system where we have preferential ranking? Do we want a German-style MMP system? I think that's premature. Those, to me, are consequences of the values and principles that we as Canadians think should be embodied in an electoral system. Um, in the previous panel, we heard a, a really interesting thought piece on Israel and why it may be appropriate for um, Canada. Well, um, it's really important to remember that electoral systems certainly produce things. They will result in a change in a number of things, parties, formation of government, and also the way citizens 
think about their preferences. But they also uh, have to be embedded in the context that they're created. So an electoral system used in Italy or uh, Israel will not be the same as in Canada. That they are both a mirror uh, in terms of reflecting the values of Canadian society and the, and the principles that we have as well as a spotlight that shine on certain aspects that we want. The question that was asked in the previous panel about whether we want the bloc as a significant force or not is a really important and interesting one that has to be decided by Canadians about what should Parliament do. So the electoral system is a reflection of that, I would argue. The second thing I think that their engagement, their process should be important to the process is they need to engage elected representatives. I was involved in a, in a process in Ontario uh, called the Ontario Citizens Assembly uh, where elected representatives, and this was done in British Columbia as well, where elected representatives were not included. And I think that's a real failure, both on the part of the designers of the process, but also in terms of creating buy-in. Um, Pre-budget consultation that they're doing now, I think does this nominally, but it's a bit of the icing without the cake, if you will. Uh, I've suggested um, in the document about climate change, which I would suggest to the minister if she ever wanted to ask me, uh, that would be useful as community-based salons where there's face-to-face -face deliberation facilitated by members of parliament. And this is an opportunity to engage citizen, create understanding for trade-offs, and, and perhaps create community capacity. Now, I know what you're saying is, why would a conservative uh, member of parliament ever want to do this? And I think the answer is because it's not at this stage about choosing a system. It's about having a discussion about what elected representatives should do. So one, a, a robust engagement strategy. Two, an engagement strategy that involves elected representatives. Three, is to use some kind of random, random sampling of average citizens to make a decision about this. Uh, randomly selected, demographically representative citizens of the broader public, I think would be a great model, the citizens' assembly model, to, to provide feedback on what the system should be. We too often forget that an electoral system is really a system for citizens. It's not for politicians. It's not for electoral systems experts. It's not for professors. It's for citizens. How best to get citizens involved and actually have them make that decision. In order to do that, I think we need to have trust in their faith and reason, uh, a belief in their reason to do so. And the evidence that I've seen in my um, work has shown that they're able and willing to take that task. So regional-based citizens' assemblies that would spend at least three weekends learning, deliberating, and making recommendations not on systems, but on the values that underlie the systems uh, would be, I think, a great way to begin the conversation. Um, and then these principles, I think, should form the basis of what an electoral system should do. They're not systems themselves. But these proposals would go to a national citizens' assembly held in, in Ottawa, uh, call it the country in a room, if you will. A demographically representative uh, group of 100, maybe 200 citizens meeting in Ottawa on stage, uh, available to, for the public to participate and watch and follow, having a discussion about what an electoral system should do. And that body would make recommendations of the, of the models to the parliamentary committee, which would in turn um, follow through. So. Um, um, the, the question about a referendum is an interesting one, um, and my opinion, and of course I'm not a constitutional lawyer, so take that as you, as you will, is must the government hold a referendum? I would say no. Um, the changes made in the Fair Elections Act were arguably more encompassing than what might be proposed here, and no one suggested a referendum for that. Uh, I think um, there is no legal requirement, but there is and is certainly an important one around legitimacy. If there is broad public engagement, not consultation, but engagement, and a robust educational campaign, I don't see the reason. Having deliberative bodies uh, is actually a higher threshold than a standard blunt instrument of a referendum. Remember, a referendum is, an, is a vehicle whereby citizens mark, in a, mark their preference as they walk into a ballot, or maybe they've thought about it, maybe they haven't. Deliberative 
um, experiments really assume, and James Fishkin's work on this is really insightful, assume that people's opinions change if they learn about the process. So I don't believe there's uh, a need for a referendum, but of course that's an open question. Um, the argument is that section 44 of the Constitution uh, says that Parliament may exclusively make laws amending the Constitution of Canada in relation to the Executive of Canada or the Senate and House of Commons. Uh, opponents of this say that, well, the, the government tried to change the Senate and they weren't able to unilaterally do that under this opinion, under this section. Why can they do it under the House of Commons? And I think the court was very clear on that. They said that Section 44 was limited and that the Prime Minister's desire to have consultative elections and term limits for senators was a significant alteration to, quote, the fundamental nature and character of the role of the Senate. And I would agree. Uh, the, Senate, uh, the court said, the purpose of consultative elections is clear, to bring about a Senate with a popular mandate. What I would suggest is that changing an electoral system does not dramatically change the representative function of what elected representatives do. Um, it does not affect the principle under which um, uh, elected representatives work, and that is the principle of representation by population. I think if we had multi-member constituencies, uh, such as the single transferable vote, or such as proportional representation, or even mixed member proportional, there'd be a greater argument for this. Um, if, as the Prime Minister uh, has suggested that we have alternative vote, which is a preferential ranking system where there's still a single member constituency, I don't think that there would be a need for this. Um, I've spent more time on process than I would have liked, and uh, I've uh, pretty much run out of time. So perhaps in the question period, we can talk about the different models. But I think what I wanted to impress upon the, the point I wanted to make was uh, simply one, as far as I can see, there's no legal requirement for a referendum. There may be a legitimacy one. Uh, and two, that I think section 44 of the Constitution is robust enough to handle the changes that are anticipated by the government. Thanks. Are two answers to that question. One is, uh, it's a recognition that no one electoral system does anything, everything. So, I mean, that's a sort of starting basic position. And two is to understand all electoral systems as trade-offs. But the second part is we don't even talk about electoral systems prior to talking about what we understand representation to do and what it should do. Um, related to that, there is a study, an uh, interesting study by David Farrell and his colleagues asking professors around the world, political science professors who teach electoral systems, asking them two questions. What's the best system? And what are the most important values? And what Farrell and his colleagues found is among experts, political scientists, who study and teach this stuff, there was not a clear link between the system they chose and the values they thought were important. So um, it's tricky. Um, but I think, uh, if it's properly thought about and deliberated, um, it can be done. And that's what was done in British Columbia and in Ontario. Um, so again, it's uh, concepts we're all familiar with. As you just said, you know, uh, do we value the principle of local representation more so than proportionality? Do we value voter choice? Um, how important is a simple ballot? Maybe that would rule out a mixed member ballot where there's two sides to the ballot. Um, do we want greater number of political parties? Recognizing that Canada will never be Israel. I mean, even if we had a pure proportional system with a 3% threshold, we're not going to get 11 parties. Um, it's very unlikely we get 11 parties. Uh, so um, there's a rec there needs to be a recognition about what, uh, par what parliament should do, what government should do, and what the role of voters should be in making those choices. I would agree with what Rick said about um, the question about getting low propensity voters to, uh, to be engaged, I think really is about uh, to ask the question why they're not engaged. And um, I think civic education and civic literacy strategies at the local level is the way to go. And that's been what I've seen. Um, and if you think about you know, some really innovative 
strategies used around the world, um, it's been appealing to people who are marginalized that they should have a voice and that their voice matters. One of the most famous examples is in Brazil, in Porto Alegre, where they have participatory budgeting. And participatory budgeting has a spillover in voting in, uh, in municipal elections. So you get all members of the, of the community to say, how do you want a certain percentage of your taxes to be spent? And they get to decide that, and the council is bound by that. As a result of that, there's sort of a democratic dividend that those people have a greater propensity to vote. So I think it has to be tied to interest, but also education. It's important to be reminded that underlying any government initiative, in particular this, is who benefits. Absolutely true. And I can see why you'd think that the presentation is apolitical, but it's, it's not. I mean, it really is around um, certainly whatever decision is made. But whatever decisions are made by any government on any policy, there's an element of someone benefiting, right? I mean, as, and I think that's your point, is that all government actions are political in the sense that they favor one group over another. There's no such thing as a non-political action. True. So given that we accede the government on other things, why would we not say that we are putting our trust in government on this? I mean, assuming that we believe in mandates, and that's a big assumption, um, we enact governments and we elect governments to make choices on our behalf for four years, and then if we don't like it, we kick the rascals out. So um, in that case, this policy is no different than anything else. That doesn't, of course, ex answer your question. Um, it's an elite choice, agreed. Uh, I'll, I mean, I'm trying to think of a policy that isn't elite driven. Uh, I can't think of one off the top of my head. Um, but that doesn't also uh, absolve me of explaining why um, why we shouldn't go through with this. Um, I guess the one thing I would say is that unlike other policies, the political actors will change as a result of the initiative. So while at this point there's a prima facie argument that it might benefit the liberals for a particular set of reasons, it's a plausible argument, um, we know, certainly in the New Zealand case, that parties also change their behavior uh, and that that can uh, change the, the beneficiary of that uh, reform. So while it might have the immediate benefit for the Liberals, and while there's people who make projections based on if we had this model in the last election, this would be the results. I mean, that's baloney because the preferences of citizens change too. So, you know, to follow up on Tamara's point, there's, there's it's too many uh, things to untangle, but um, I think you're absolutely right to remind us this is a political decision and it shouldn't be seen as apolitical. Absolutely true.